This is lecture 8 in our course on the Italian Renaissance. Moving into the terza generazione, or third generation of Italian artists in the 1400s, this lecture will cover mostly secular art. This map of Italy showing the Renaissance rulers also indicates where artistic innovation is taking place in the period from about 1464 to about 1494. At a quick glance, you will note that Florence still leads Italy with the greatest number of prominent artists. We will look most closely at the politics of that territory, along with Botticelli's most celebrated works, inextricably tied to the increasing humanism of the later 1400s. We will also be looking at the work done in Ferrara, under the aegis of the Este family, or the Saloni dei Mesi. Switching from a geographical map to a timeline, which you can also find in your handouts, you will notice the Salone dei Mesi in about 1470-71. to Botticelli's most iconic works date to the 1480s. There are also religious works that show a strong shift towards classicism and anticipate the works of the High Renaissance. In 1480, Pope Sixtus IV brought the artists of the day to create frescoes for the refurbished Sistine Chapel's walls, and Leonardo da Vinci also started in the 1480s. However, we will look more closely at these works in lectures 9 and 10. For third generation artists, perspective is now taken for granted and studies move towards other stimuli, such as the problem of assembling figures or achieving energy in contour lines. Having mastered the art of creating volumetric figures and spaces, artists turn to the challenge of movement with more tension and expressive intensity. Florence had a somewhat turbulent but fascinating history during this time. Primarily, it was a golden age under the rule of Lorenzo de' Medici called the Magnificent from 1469 to 1492. His rule was preceded by the brief rule of his father, Piero de' Medici, following the death of the great Cosimo, from 1464 to 1469. Piero was not particularly popular, but as a true Medici of his time, he cultivated the intellectual and artistic life of the city. He was the one who commissioned Benozzo Gozzoli to paint the Magi Chapel, which we viewed in the last lecture. You'll remember that it glorified the Medici family by embedding portraits of them in an otherwise religious narrative related to Jesus' birth. Lorenzo came to power in 1469 at the tender age of 20. Although he took a more moderate approach, political factions remained, and enemies of the family wished to see its young leading members dead. Indeed, his brother Giovanni was killed during the Pazzi Conspiracy of 1478, that also targeted Lorenzo's life. The half-successful assassination was considered especially egregious because it took place during High Mass in the Florentine Cathedral before thousands of witnesses. Despite his tragic loss, Lorenzo turned the situation into a political triumph and even gained the love of the Florentines who participated in hunting down the conspirators. Ultimately, about 80 people were hanged, and Leonardo, who was also a young man in Florence at this time, added to the naturalistic drawings in his sketchbook with the depiction of a hanged man, accompanied by a written description. Lorenzo further benefited from the situation by becoming the first of the Medici clan to be officially named Signore, or ruler, in the Constitution. He became, perhaps, a more splendid patron than even his grandfather Cosimo, he was a cultivated and refined man who invited poets, scholars, philosophers, and artists to his court. He himself wrote poetry. He was a member of the Neoplatonic Academy and established a taste for objects rich in philosophical significance. He had more personal relationships with artists as well. Michelangelo claimed to have had a place right at the Medici table when he was an adolescent learning the art of sculpture in the Medici Garden in the early 1490s. Lorenzo's death marks the virtual end of the early Renaissance in Florence and opens a transitional phase. For a moment, darkness fell on humanism with the rise of the preacher Savonarola. I'll be discussing Savonarola and this transition in more depth when we begin our look at the High Renaissance in Lecture 10. Due to the influence of Lorenzo and other humanist patrons, the significance of private versus merely public, whether civic or religious, art grew.
the language of art became more sophisticated and erudite, with allegorical, mythological, philosophical, and literary allusions, often available only to the elite possessing the interpretative keys. For this reason, we'll have to look more carefully at the Neoplatonic Academy. Humanism brought back Platonism, which had a rebirth at the end of the 1400s. The new establishment of a Greek chair in Italy's principal universities particularly allowed for the direct study of Plato's texts. You'll remember that this study of Greek was the result of a broader political situation, the Greek refugees coming to Italy during the Ottoman conquest of Greek territories, notably Constantinople, brought with them a first-hand acquaintance with the Greek language. In Florence, the establishment of a Neoplatonic Academy symbolized another rebirth, that of the classical antique Academy of Athens. It included an important coterie of artists, philologists, and intellectuals. Besides those listed below, Alberti, Giuliano de' Medici, and Lorenzo the Magnificent were members. They met in the villa of Carreggi, close to Florence. Marsilio Ficino, the chief philosopher of Renaissance Neoplatonism, made the classic translations of Plato from Greek to Latin, which was still the scholarly language of the Renaissance, in 1484, as well as translations of the Neoplatonists of the centuries between Plato and the Renaissance. Following the suggestions laid out by Pletho, Ficino tried to synthesize Christianity and Platonism, which is really the essence of what we're decoding in Renaissance art. Incidentally, Ficino was the one who introduced the concept of platonic love as we understand it today. Pico della Mirandola also based his ideas chiefly on Plato, but retained a deep respect for Aristotle, and was more of an eclectic, reaching into the study of Hebrew and the Talmudic sources. After all, the Old Testament is more integral to Christian belief than Greek philosophy. Pico believed in the ideal of a universal philosophy and the dignity of mankind. Angelo Poliziano was a humanist, philologist, poet, and dramatist who composed in Greek, Latin, and the Italian dialect. He was also secretary to Lorenzo the Magnificent. He exemplifies the use of humanism for personal betterment. Ficino's Neoplatonic doctrine had a wide cultural influence, far beyond the confines of the Academy in Florence. It was able to achieve this because with Ficino, classical philosophy and Christianity became entirely compatible. Because of this widespread acceptance, we should dive a little deeper into Platonism to fully appreciate Botticelli's upcoming works, among others. In Platonic theory, the One, which is identified with the Christian God, radiates being. Its emanations of being are like sun rays bringing life in descending order from ideas and intellect to inanimate matter. As already theorized during the first half of the Quattrocento, human beings occupy a unique position. To be more precise, the human soul is the midpoint between the divine or celestial realm and the terrestrial world of matter. Each human being has free will and can decide to accede to the higher realm, the divine, or fall into the baser realm, the earthly. However, humans alone in the natural world have the ability both to live an earthly life and to perceive the divine because of their unique ability to reason, their intellect, which other earthly entities, such as animals, plants, and minerals, do not have. Ideally, the human soul aspires to return to the one from which it emanates. This is an aspiration for knowledge, but of course, the truth is reached only after death. Even so, the process of ascent can begin on earth. How? For Ficino, it's through the mediation of love and beauty. Love is the desire of beauty. Only love can guide humankind up towards God, the spring of true and perfect beauty, as noted, classical philosophy and Christianity become entirely compatible. In art, the doctrine had a very direct impact. First of all, the Medici, who were steeped in Neoplatonic philosophy, were not only important patrons in Florence, but also the emulation of the Italian courts with the syncretism of Christianity and classical philosophy, but not just classical philosophy, also classical culture more broadly, 
mythological subjects were reintroduced into art without qualms. These subjects, formerly dismissed as pagan, were reinterpreted through a Christian lens and could thus be considered just as revelatory of an arcane truth as biblical subjects. The doctrine also naturally reinforced the artistic search for beauty, and if you pause to consider what you might think of as beautiful, it's probably not so very different from the Renaissance folks. In artistic terms, beauty was equated with balanced proportions and aesthetic harmony, essentially the same guiding principle of antique classical art. Venus, the great sinner of the pagan gods for having committed adultery with Mars, was completely reinterpreted by Neoplatonic philosophers. She became one of the most frequently depicted subjects for Renaissance artists under a duo typology. The first is celestial Venus, symbol of spiritual love, which, as noted, pushed humans towards that mystical ascension. The second aspect is terrestrial Venus, who symbolizes the instinct and passion pulling humankind down. This duo typology is traceable to two separate stories about her birth, and it's worth mentioning them since we are looking at Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Terrestrial Venus would simply be the daughter of Zeus by the usual means of procreation. Celestial Venus has a much more interesting story. When Saturn was overthrowing his father Uranus, as the gods do, and as would happen again when Jupiter overthrew Saturn, he cut off his genitals and tossed them into the sea. The sea foam that formed around the genitals engendered Venus. Like most gods, she emerged fully grown and was carried on the ocean's waves to the island of Cythera. Another theme was the gods and heroes caught between virtue and vice, which in Neoplatonic thought is just the place where the human spirit remained in suspension between the divine and the base. Third generation artists influenced by Neoplatonism included Botticelli, Antonio and Piero Polaiuolo, Leonardo da Vinci, Perugino, Luca Signorelli, and others. Michelangelo's art and poetry is also infused with Neoplatonic themes, but let's turn to our first artworks. Fra Carnavale's Birth of the Virgin, dating to around 1467 and located at the Met, is a religious work. It follows a new trend of overwhelming the ostensible main subject with ancillary scenes in a contemporary setting. The painting is full of people in Renaissance clothing, but it's also full of animals. Most of their actions are entirely incidental to the main scene. There is also a detailed landscape background receding in the distance. It goes out onto an ocean filled with ships. This convention of creating detailed landscape background was imported into Italy from where? Yes, Flemish painting. But oddly, the palace is decorated with some strange pseudo-classical panels. What are they doing there? A standard interpretation is that the juxtaposition of Christian and pagan imagery highlights the transition of an old era to a new one, but the full frontal nudity, male on the left and female on the right, is even in a monochrome representation of a stone relief still unusual for its time, and the lechery that goes with it seems unnecessary. In fact, in the context of a religious picture, it seems rather inappropriate. The imagery is also hard to miss, given that, in scale, these relief figures are larger than the figures of Saint Anne and the women attending to the newborn child. Even if there is an underlying moral message, the imagery remains a bit jarring. I've never been convinced that showing people images of naughty things creates more of a sense of revulsion than interest, whether it be humorous or titillating. Either way, if the scenes from everyday contemporary life distract the viewer, these images detract from the overall mood of the picture, which should be solemn and dignified. We have already seen court art from the beginning of the third generation. Court art refers to art that was produced in association with princely or seigneurial palaces, and while this may refer to any number of artistic objects, we have particularly looked at large decorative projects that covered and transformed interior spaces. The Camera Picta for the Gonzaga family in Mantua was probably the most spectacular example of this. The private chapel of the Medici Palace, the Magi Chapel, was another example.
Yet a third example dates to the same years and was executed in Ferrara for the Este family rulers. At the outset of this period, Borso d'Este was signore. He had a taste for particularly lavish artistic decoration and brought in a group of artists to fresco the walls of a room in his Palazzo Schifanoia. The room came to be called the Salone dei Mesi, or Hall of the Months, as the fresco cycle is divided into 12 sections that represent the 12 months of the year. Each month includes three bands. On top, there is a mythological scene representing the triumph of a god who is associated in some way with that month. In the middle, there is the astrological sign associated with that month. And on the bottom, the largest band, there is a contemporary depiction of the Este family in the seigneurial court of Ferrara. Each of these scenes features Borso in a setting with a palace or loggia that opens onto a landscape with peasants in the background. Unfortunately, many of these works were destroyed in the late 16th century, but the ones that remain indicate the high quality of Francesco del Coso's work in particular. Perhaps the Camera Picta offered a more spectacular display of courtly life, but besides the similar theme, the Salone dei Mesi also shares the use of trompe l'oeil, architectural elements, and figures that interact with real space. However, I'm discussing this work here for its inclusion of secular imagery that is totally pagan in the mythological scenes and the upper zones. As with the Magi Chapel of the Medici in Florence, and of course with the Camera Picta of the Gonzaga in Mantua, all images serve to aggrandize the rulers. In the Camera Picta, the luxury of the court is literally put on display. In the Chapel of the Magi, the extravagant cortege is equated with Medici magnificence, and here, in the Solone dei Mesi, the realm of the gods, in particular Jupiter, is being equated with Borso d'Este's terrestrial realm. As I noted, Borso d'Este brought in several painters, but the best was Francesco del Cosa. He is responsible for the panels depicting March and April, among others. As you can see, we have two of the Olympian gods in triumph, Minerva and Venus, respectively. Despite the pomp of their triumphal depictions, they appear in natural landscape settings. The humanist program is noteworthy, and the zodiac signs are accompanied by so-called decans, or stellar constellations that govern smaller areas of the zodiac sign slice of the heavens. The dark-skinned decan for March is depicted here, along with the curly-haired decan for April. The ram, for Aries, is depicted in the center. To stick with the theme of eroticism in general, and with Venus in particular, I'll focus on the panel representing May. Its contemporary courtly scene represents Borso d'Este returning from the hunt and giving a coin to his jester. The astrological sign is Taurus, the bull, and the mythological scene is a triumph of Venus. Here, we see Mars kneeling in subjugation before a seated Venus. Since Mars is the god of war, his subjugation represents an allegory of peace. He and Venus were lovers, and so there is inherent eroticism in this subjugation as well. You may notice that Mars and Venus look very much like the contemporary Renaissance courtiers that surround them. Montaigne, who was known for his archaeological exactitude, would likely be horrified, but Montaigne's approach was unique, even up through the 18th century. It is springtime, the season of Venus, and the picture is full of allusions to her. The pair of doves, which represent love, are associated with her. The swans, for their beauty, are associated with her and typically draw her chariot. The rabbits are symbols of fecundity and are also associated with Venus in the spring. Red roses and myrtle are her flowers. At the upper right, you see the three graces, minor goddesses who were attendants to Venus. The full frontal female nudity is rare, and the works are not entirely classicizing, although there is clearly a familiarity with the conventional classical mode of representing the three graces in a row with their arms interlaced and one facing in the opposite direction from the others. Other than that, Venus is represented by all the hanky-panky going on in this scene. There's a particularly naughty action going down in the lower right, where a man advances his hand between his female companion's thighs as everyone looks on. Overall, the mood is light and happy, it's springtime, and the world is at peace.
Alessandro Botticelli had a successful workshop in Florence. The painter enjoyed Medici patronage and certainly came in contact with the circle of scholars, poets, and philosophers around Lorenzo de' Medici. His mythological subjects, which really stand out for their time, are his most immediately recognizable works, but he was also an active portraitist and, like most artists of the Renaissance, primarily undertook religious subjects. I'll share a few of his religious works in the next lecture, since I'm dividing these two by theme rather than artist or chronology. The well-known mythological works I'll discuss today date from the 1480s, which was certainly his most successful and resplendent period. As we'll see, he opened the decade by accepting a prestigious invitation to Rome. For now, let's look at his most iconic work. The birth of Venus dates to around 1480 to 1485. It was probably commissioned by Lorenzo the Magnificent's younger cousin, Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de' Medici, as it was reported in the 1500s to have been located at the country property belonging to the Medici cousins, the Villa di Castello. Rather than further investigating the precise patron, for our purposes, it's most important to know that this was a private rather than public commission, and furthermore, that this private setting was something akin to a vacation home, away from the city and its official dome, and thus invites a reading associated with leisure, relaxation from restrictions, and pleasure. I'd like to invite you now to just view the work and make your own observations with regard to both subject matter and style. In fact, you may want to pause the video and find an image online. There are extremely high resolution images available to the general republic. I'm going to describe the image, but after that, your impressions will never be free from what you know. And you know I value careful observation and a bit of initial guesswork. Having made my case, we can talk about the subject matter first. What you see is Venus, at the time of her birth from the sea foam. She's being transported to shore on a somewhat fanciful scallop shell. She's propelled by the wind, personified here by Zephyr. You can see the lines coming from his mouth that indicate his breath. Zephyr is embraced by a female character, probably symbolizing the physical nature of the act of love and suggesting the winds of passion. She may be Chloris, who was not only abducted by Zephyr, but was the goddess associated with flowers and spring growth, giving her a connection to Venus as well. That would explain the shower of roses around the pair. However, since she is blowing as well, she may be another wind. Venus is about to reach the shore, where a richly dressed female figure waits to clothe the somewhat reservedly nude newborn goddess. This figure is likely one of the Hours, or Horai, who preside over the changing seasons and serve Venus. Due to the flowered pattern of her dress, she would be the Hora of Spring. The shores would be those of the island of Cythera or Cyprus, both associated with Venus. The subject relates to our core Renaissance idea of a rebirth and emulation of antiquity, because the subject was known as an artistic subject, not in surviving artwork, but in written descriptions from antiquity. Later, when the remains of Pompeii and its environs were excavated in the mid-18th century, antiquarians would find their lost painting of Venus being transported on a shell. This is the first monumental image of the nude goddess since Roman times. It's clear that Botticelli is referencing the classical contrapposto pose, and particularly the pudica pose, which is a pose of modesty that we saw artists of the earlier Quattrocento referencing as well. However, the pose is being used to a greatly different effect, reflecting the very essence of the subjects and the purpose of the pictures. I'll say more about that, but let's first determine whether this is a true contrapposto. Remember, a contrapposto pose requires that a straight leg supports the body while a bent leg provides balance. Is Venus's straight leg supporting her body? No. It is inclined too far to the right. This is much closer to what I've called the Gothic sway, although the virtually impossible pose of the Virgin of Paris, for example, is nonetheless more balanced. Venus's balance is so precarious that it also seems the wind could tip her over. Perhaps this effect was intentional, as she is about to reach the shore and take her first step. She could draw her back leg forward to step onto the floor. However, 
this would require a superhuman grace, and since gravity has such little pull on her, the goddess seems almost to be floating or levitating. With her pale skin and wispily blowing hair, it imparts an ethereal rather than an earthy feeling. In fact, almost all the bodies seem weightless. The horror of spring bears no naturalistic relationship to gravity either, and the drapes that surround her elegantly billow in the wind. Venus herself has other anatomical problems than her pose. The area from her neck to her shoulder seems impossibly stretched out, another deviation from naturalism that evokes the international Gothic and Neo-Byzantine trends that preceded Renaissance innovations in Italy. I'm sorry to say that these anatomical anomalies have really bothered some of my students over the years, but it's important to understand that they are meant to be subtle. The elongation has an aesthetic purpose. It exaggerates the S-curve, adding to the overall elegance of the figure by softening the curves, as in the more gently sloping shoulders, where the strategic placement of hair hides, to some degree, the unnatural length of her neck and upper chest. Botticelli's notably linear style emphasizes both pleasingly rounded contours and more complex arabesques. Literal lines mingle with and generate visual paths, a few of which I've traced, but which you could spend plenty of time tracing onto the image. The hair and the folds in the drapery create a labyrinth of curves. The linear approach privileges outline over modeling. There is a delicate deployment of light and dark to create volume, but combined with the sharp contours, the overall effect is shallow, almost like relief sculpture. The linear approach also emphasizes movement. As mentioned, the drapery is highly animated and there is a feeling of expanding, leaning, blowing, and billowing from left to right. Even Hora's counter-movement only serves to emphasize the gust of energy from left to right as the drapery is swept up behind her. Like her classical counterparts, Venus is serene, rather aloof and self-assured. Despite her weightlessness, she is still voluptuous, and despite her half-hearted modesty, in which the viewer is casually allowed to appreciate her exposed breast, she imparts the promise of sensual pleasure. The use of her hair to cover her genitalia is rather suggestive of what is, in fact, covered, and like the horrors bunching drapery, appears rather yonic or vulvar. Long flowing hair is strongly associated with femininity, just as the sea itself. It appears to be an unbridledly pagan depiction of ancient Greco-Roman mythology. But is that so? How did we get to this moment where the female nude is no longer a shameful, sinful Eve, but rather celebrated, admired, and put on display for the viewer's enjoyment? Scholarly discussions remain lively today, and many scholars believe the work represents a serious subject, since the pagan subject matter still had to be justified in the Christian society, Neoplatonism, which is where we started, provided the perfect means of syncretizing Christian belief and classical thought. Are we looking at celestial Venus or terrestrial Venus here? Many assume her nudity, her sensuality, make her profane, but we know that it is celestial Venus who was born of the sea foam, and so we can identify her as such here. Somewhat paradoxically, even in Renaissance thought, the nude is the pure form, since it is unadorned and natural. The body can be considered beautiful, but remember that beauty is conflated with love, which allows access to God. Thus, Botticelli's Venus stands in for divine love, rather than embodying the merely human, physical love. Keep in mind, too, that her birth from the sea maps nicely onto the Christian concept of baptism. Nudity, in this interpretation, would be more symbolic than sensual, although, on the surface, this view skirts the issue of the body's materiality and its specificity, for even an ideal must be rendered concrete and specific. It glosses over the possibility of a kind of idolatry of corporeal beauty, never mind arousal, and it was actually Michelangelo who later lamented in his poetry that he had probably worshipped corporeal beauty in a not-so-godly way. In any case, 
since this ultimately comes down to a belief system, a combination of religious faith and philosophical reasoning, we don't have to be convinced to follow the thought pattern. It may feel like a convenient way to justify enjoying the nude in art, and it certainly opened the door for more daring and less contemplative renderings of the female nude in the 1500s. Ultimately, Botticelli's Venus doesn't have to be tied down to arcane neoplatonic trappings that are fully reconciled to Christian belief or entirely liberated by the hedonistic side of humanism that was certainly manifesting in society for her to mark a milestone in Western art. I'd like to discuss a bit more quickly Botticelli's other mythological work housed at the Castello Villa owned by the Medici cousins. Like the Venus, Primavera is a tempera painting on a wood panel. The exact subject matter remains a bit elusive to scholars, but I'm convinced by Charles Dempsey's argument that we don't need to look for a specific source. Instead, he claims that Primavera is a kind of poetic appropriation of many interrelated sources, with the result that the artist creates a kind of fable of his own. This is not an entirely incidental concept during the Renaissance. We'll remember that, around the year 1400, the humanist Villani had made the first explicit demand for a place for the visual arts among the liberal arts, or humanities. The argument would be that artists used their intellect more than other craftspeople. Good compositions required special creative or inventive powers, what was in Latin called inventio. Thus, rather than telling a story, the mood evoked by the painting is important. Here we see a slow-moving dance of nature and time. Even so, we should have a better understanding of who the figures represent. The Primavera is a sort of counterpart to the birth. At its center, we have earthly Venus, who, rather than spiritual love, represents physical love and reproduction. Her son Cupid, the god of love, flies above her. Flora, who stands to Venus's left, our right, is the goddess of spring and flowers. On the far right is Chloris, a nymph who was also associated with flowers and new springtime growth. This would show the moment when she was abducted by Zephyr, the god of the west wind, whom she eventually married. This type of eros, or physical attraction, would fall under the province of Cupid. Because of the strange way the women on the right overlap and the similarity in their appearance, some have read them as the same figure, represented at different moments in time. The three graces, whose typical intertwining motif was known from surviving ancient statuary, as we saw earlier, have a particular concentration of linear energy, with visual paths sumptuously undulating between the three goddesses. Their sheer fabrics, which evoke a convention developed during the Greek classical period to reveal the beauty of the female nude, while also preserving feminine modesty, add to the ethereal quality that they share with Botticelli's Venus. On the far left, Mercury uses his caduceus to stir up some clouds and bring change in the weather. All in all, in lyrical terms that once again emphasize outline, fluid contours, and undulating visual paths that enliven the composition, Viewers get the sense that time is fleeting, and antiquity is a lost golden age. Piero di Cosimo's painting, Mars, Venus, and Cupid, dating to around 1490, is another mythological subject that had already been explored by Botticelli. I usually ask my students to explain how this scene represents an allegory of love triumphing over war. One of the first steps is identifying love with Venus and war with Mars. You might recognize all the attributes and allusions to these two deities. The white rabbit, the butterfly, and doves all have symbolic value, as does the myrtle, which is sacred to Venus. The armor belonging to the undressed Mars lies at his side. The background is populated with putti, further symbolizing Venus's dominion. But how has love conquered war? In metaphorical terms, war has been put to sleep by love. That's to say, Venus has worn Mars out with their lovemaking, and now he has succumbed to sleep, leaving the world at peace. 